thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, of course. How course. long have we been trying to do this? Like three months? Uh, quite some You're time. So and busy. that's 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 on me. I'm really bad at scheduling. So no, I'm the bad. same way. You know what's funny? I haven't shot a podcast in um, two months. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Damn. Just and from being busy or? That's part of it, but also like a little bit about what we spoke about before. Just mm -hmm. uh, imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like, why would anybody even want to listen to me speak, right? Yeah. Like, no, there are photographers who are way better than me. They should have podcasts and not listen to them. But like, you know, and it's a weird situation. And I find that it's getting worse. Like, the more that I'm shooting, the more that I'm creating. Yeah. I'll shoot something and I'll look at it. And I'm like, yes, I love it. And then I'll post it and then I'll hate it. <laughs> 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 right or i'll make a video i'll spend 10 hours editing a video yeah and when the moment i finish it i love it next day this is trash i hate it i'm gonna do it again yeah. and you know, does that happen to you 100 percent. like <laughs> i have a i have a specific drive that's just for like the maybes and it's like i've created some like self-promoting content like ugc stuff mm -hmm. and then like just messing around with like different lenses i create little videos and in my mind, you know, I think I'm Quentin Tarantino over here making all these videos about myself doing, you know, minimal things around the house and stuff. But like, I, I don't ever know what to use that content for. So like, I'll think it's like awesome, awesome. And then I'll put it all together. And at the end, I'm, I look at I'm just like, I have no idea like what this is good for. And like, right. I don't want to put this out into the world because then people are going to be like, what is this guy doing with this video? This makes no sense. And which just adds to my feeling of inadequacy and just imposter syndrome to that point. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that mainly comes from social media, to be honest, right. because back in, I mean, I started in photography. Oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> Way back when been some time, many eons ago, um, no, I started off in college. I was the guy at bars taking pictures of drunk people for mm -hmm. like Facebook to post the next day type thing. Right. Um, and in those days I was looking at photo books and like famous photographers, Peter Lindbergh, uh, Walter Eos. And like, I would look at those books and that's where my inspiration would come from. Now with social, because of the access that we have and like then the whole, the liking thing and like the validation of random people and stuff like that, we're so inherently like glued to that feeling that that is what i mean that's a real stopper for me for like putting out content because i don't want to get to a point where like i start feeling like that right. and like i've been able to try to or i've been able to kind of reel that feeling in a little bit more by muting a bunch of different accounts that i was following like i really only subscribe to either models i have worked with mm -hmm. Uh, photographers I've worked with or like no um, and then like the very famous ones that I've always been inspired by then the same thing yeah because the it's like thing. it's too much man yeah. we get fed too much information and like that ends up bringing up the feelings of anxiety the feelings of like I'm not doing enough they're up here I'm not there yet like I still have such a ladder to climb but it's like everyone has their own time you can't rush your time to meet someone else's timeline right situation yeah. and that's like that's unfortunately that's a thing that i think all creatives go through um and it's just a lesson that we kind of have to push through which is not easy by any means no. but but yeah I, I mean i that happens to me all the time and like i won't post for months at a time <laughs> because i get hit with that block feeling of like eh, it's not good enough right so what do you do when you're feeling that, I mean, is there like a, a process that you go through to overcome those emotions or so you just like wait it out let me sleep on it for a couple of weeks <laughs> it's weird because i know exactly what i need to do to mm -hmm. get out of my funk mm -hmm. i just find myself it's easier said than done like the willpower to actually push yourself out of those like kind of dark moments is very hard uh, but for me like i know if i'm eating nutritional food if i'm going to bed and getting enough sleep drink enough water and then exercising literally every single day like or not even exercising like taking a walk outside just getting out of my apartment because the other thing with creatives especially for me i work in my apartment pretty much every single day for the most part alone i zoom with marco a bunch um but for the most part it's like just me so mm -hmm. getting out of the house and like just walking around seeing nature or, like seeing people walking around i think is huge help right. especially like because I feel after COVID, we as humans just got so conditioned to like being inside. And that was actually a 
big thing for me post COVID. And that was something that I had to like work through in therapy is like, get out of the house, get back out there. It's safe. Like go hang out with people, be, be uh, open to receiving Mm -hmm. people's attention and stuff like that. So to that point, it's like, I know what I need to do, but it's sometimes hard finding that willpower to like push yourself to do it. No, it's huge. It's, um, I was having this conversation a couple of days ago with a good friend of mine and it's the balance between motivation and discipline. Yeah. Right. And how we compared motivation to like, um, to a girl. Okay. And motivation is there and it fills you up with energy and excitement and you want to take over the world because when you're with her and when you have her, it's, you know, it feels like you can do anything you want. But then the moment you actually need to commit to something, the moment it gets hard and, and you have to wake up early, you have to stay up late the motivation is gone like it's not there the way you thought they would be or it would be and it's all about discipline at this point but then it's when are you too disciplined to the point where it's not even you being creative anymore now it's just going through the motions and just getting things done and i find even for me it's it's hard to be creative when i'm just trying to like either hit a deadline or meet a quota it's i'm just working to the end i'm not working the process yeah uh, and the creative aspect of it all and I find that a lot of photographers and a lot of creatives go through that. It's yeah. it's you're you're almost losing creativity for a paycheck. Yeah, a hundred percent. And to that point, like I would say, this past we're already in May. Um, I would say April, March, and the tail end of February, we were locked in with work and like at the amount of hours I spent at my desk, like editing and going through footage, was a huge burnout for me. And it wasn't until about last week. Um, I don't know if you saw, uh, I posted a little, like one of those Wes Anderson trending videos oh, that's dude, going around. That's awesome. Dude, that was the first piece of content in like two months and a half that I had done for myself that was like creative, that was yeah. not based on a client's needs. And like, it felt so good. <laughs> like such a like, oh my God, I still got it type yeah. feeling. Wow. Like, cause I was just like going through the motions and even to the point where like, I would try to get creative with client, for, with client deliverables and the client would come back, no, we need something a little less like, we just need something simple. I'm just like, oh. It's too artistic for what we need. Yeah, it's <laughs> oh, too creative. We just need like plain, plain Can simple. Can you take off the grain? I don't. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, do you want people's eyeballs? Do you want their attention? You have yeah. to, you know, make it a little bit different. It can't right. just be simple little videos and mm-hmm. stuff anymore. Like, and that just like kills me because like I want to make it more exciting, not just for the client and their audience, but for myself too. Right, right. And uh, I'm actually, so I did another uh, self-filming little video. Uh, Marco and I went to this uh, out Florida Outdoor Expo. It's okay. kind of like a boat show, but more outdoor hunting stuff. Okay. Um, and I bought some like fishing pants that some new brand that just came out. Bought them on Sunday. That Monday, I like woke up with a bolt of creativity and like came up with a little script in like two hours at like seven in the morning put on the pants, went out, filmed all day, literally filmed everything, one lens, like one focal length, Mm -hmm. and just like found different angles to shoot myself from. Mm -hmm. And right now I have about a six minute long video. I need to cut that down big time. (laughs) Uh, But just like, I I watched that six minutes, dude. It doesn't have a single piece of music. It's just like ambient sounds. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I don't know. It's just so, it, it, makes me so like jazzed up that like, yes, I'm getting back to like a creative flow. Right. Like I'm thinking outside the box, different angles, different ways mm-hmm. of like showing the story. And like, dude, for the beginning of 2023, I was just so burnt out that like, even on shoots for clients, I'm just like, uh, okay, yeah, I'll stand over here, get this angle. Okay, I get this thing. Like getting all the safe angles. It's like, you have to take time to like, be creative and do personal projects. I think that's huge for people. Like it can't just be about the money. You can't just chase dollars. Like right. you're gonna get burnt out and you're gonna start hating what you do, honestly. And that's something that you really want to try to avoid as a creative, in my opinion. No, of course. Um, how hard is it for you to put your creative touch to a, a big product that isn't yours, right? Like how hard is it for you and the client to come together and say, or you, for you to put in your an idea that the client may not have thought of beforehand. Right. Because at, at that point, it's the client trusting you with your vision too, right? Right. And although they're paying for it, they want they came to you because you of the work that you're putting out. Right. And so how do you explain to a client, hey, this is a cool shot, but what if we do this? Right. So 
I, at least on set, the way that I kind of approach that is we always get the clients like safety shots, yeah. no matter what we get them. And then, you know, we kind of like introduce, hey, I also want to like just play around with this other angle. And typically on set, the client's like, oh my God, yeah, great idea, great idea. But that doesn't always translate right. <laughs> in the post editing because mm -hmm. you might have the shot and like, for instance, uh, I had a recent client where I kind of played around with, um, so it was a horizontal video and then I played around with like different halves of the video and like cutting like different angles where you're seeing multiple little screens within the horizontal thing. And on set in theory, the client was, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. And then I show it and I think it looks great. It looks cool, different, edgy. And they're like, um, <laughs> no, let's just like, let's just simple transitions. Right. And I'm just like, okay, cross dissolve, here you go. <laughs> like, it's Some, like, yeah. you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes you get the clients that are like, hey, have at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do have one client that uh, we've worked with them for a couple of years now. And from the first videos, it was like kind of dull, kind of boring. The second uh, time we worked with them, a little bit more creative freedom. And then this last one, they're like, they basically like said, we just want the filmic look vibe. I was like, okay, great. And I kind of just ran with it, like playing with different scenes with like different um, overlays and stuff like that, different dust scratches and stuff and like all super random and like they loved it. And it was super fun cause like I was able to create a little bit more of a different style of video rather than just, okay, one overlay with like the little film burn and it's like, that's a whole video type thing. Right. And it's like, okay, that's, that's cool that they're like trusting me mm -hmm. enough now to like get to that creative And space. you're like growing with that client. So over time now just more, you can be as creative as you need to be. Yeah, right? exactly. And they trust your vision for that. Exactly. I want to know how you and Marco started Guava. And how did you find the name, which I love the name, by the thank way. Thank you, thank you. I love the work you. you guys are putting out. And you guys are also doing another, is it a sub-brand under Guava too? Like I follow, I follow another page of you guys and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but I want to be a part of it. <laughs> I don't know um, what's happening. So, uh, yeah, Guava K, so I'll, I'll start at the beginning. Um, so Guava K, actually, I started that with the direction of going to social media marketing. Mm -hmm. And that started literally 2019, November, right before pandemic. Um, and from 2019 to 2020, I like skyrocketed with clients on my own because everyone needed social and like all that jazz. Um, so then when the business started coming in really hot, I like went to Marco and I was like, Marco, I know he's like a very savage business guy. He's really good at sales. So I was like, what do you think about partnering up? We can both do content. We can serve social media clients and whatnot. Um, thankfully, you know, he thinks I'm an all right dude. And uh, we gel well. Right. Just all right. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were doing that for the beginning of 2020. I'd say halfway between 2020 and 2021, we kind of started dropping off the social media management aspect because honestly the amount of time that you spend with the client and like making sure the aesthetics and the branding and the captions and everything's like on brand point like i enjoy that but it was too much client facing for me like i didn't want to be that involved i'd rather produce some content for you you like it great okay you go on your own come back when you need some more client right. content type right. situation um, and then in that point too, I was really getting into video. So, and then Marco, I think had just like dipped his toes in video in the beginning. So I was like, okay, let's transition more to photo video type packaging. So that's kind of what lifted Guava K up. And that's kind of what we're pushing now. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say we're pushing more video production because that's just the industry needs more video these days. Um, photos, we obviously still offer it, but like we push video more. So, mm -hmm. um, the name. So <laughs> the name I am excited comes to hear this. from, so the guava fruit, I'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar. Um, just being, a little bit. Yeah, just a little, a little bit. bit. <laughs> um, so growing up Cuban household, guava was always like the favorite. Mm -hmm. um, guava and cream cheese, mm -hmm. guava pastries, you name it. Um, so I wanted something that was from my culture and from something that I was very familiar with. So that's where guava came and then the K being spelled C-A-Y, kind of like the Bahamian Islands, mm -hmm. the K's down there. I grew up 
uh, my family and we grew up going to the Bahamas like usually every summer. So I spent most of my childhood up until like my parents divorced when I was 18 going to, to the Bahamas and spending three months all in the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, so that was just kind of something that was in my life that I wanted to like bring back because that kind of left of my life post-divorce mm-hmm. without my choosing whatsoever. Um, so that's kind of what I brought in. And then Guava Cay just sounded like a random island. I was like, that's kind of cool. So like I put I those two it. together yeah. and it's like, you know, we live in tropical Florida mm-hmm. and it kind of all works out really nicely. Yeah. Well, it's uh, funny. I feel like you guys came out almost out of nowhere because I know you guys individually. Mm-hmm. And so when Guava came out, I'm like, what is this amazing <laughs> art? What are they doing? <laughs> Let me hold the reflective, please. <laughs> like, no, nah, I'm so like, I love your content. It was super they, clean, but it yeah. still has like a vintage aspect to it. Not, maybe yeah. not vintage, maybe classic i don't even know how to describe it because it is very modern when it comes to like the transition the effects yeah. the storytelling but it has a you almost feel like you're watching a home movie in a way thank like you, you i appreciate that, that yeah you have like that familiar, familiarity yeah with the content cool. and that's and that's something i try to push in the content that we make it's more so not necessarily product specific right it's more story driven right and that's kind of what i kind of push for i mean mm. I love movies and I'd rather shoot a somewhat movie style yeah. piece of content. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we were bidding for this one client. Um, I, they're just a very big publishing company. Okay. Um, we can and, say names here. It's a safe yeah. spot. Okay. All right. Uh, so we were pitching for Scholastic Publishing. Okay. Cool. And they wanted to do, they were doing a program where they went around to, I think it was like 180 something schools and like they give out free books to the kids and mm-hmm. they can keep them and stuff. So they wanted to shoot mini documentaries for each school wow. and kind of see how this program helped kids kind of get the joy of reading and get excited about reading. And um, unfortunately, there were some changes in the company and they ended up dropping the project but i got so excited about that because that's really like where my passion is it's like those documentary style videos and like telling the story and like the sounds of like the ambiance and like more than just putting a track over a video essentially right. like i love all those little new nuances of making a documentary and like honestly that's probably mostly what i watch on netflix these days except for like guilty pleasure shows like at the office or something <laughs> i've never seen the office before what i've never seen the office you've never seen the I've office never seen the office what ever you know it's funny <laughs> right this might be a little off topic yeah but i'm on tinder right and i'm scrolling okay. through and every girl's bio like if you haven't seen the office swipe left <laughs> i'm like i've never seen the fucking <laughs> office you know <laughs> i'm about to watch the office so i can get laid i don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick side tangent about that. I'm actually banned from Tinder. What did you do? Uh, I was trying to... T- too <laughs> handsome. I was getting too many matches. No, unfortunately not. I wish it was the case, but I tried soliciting my photography services on did. there. And they're like, <laughs> I put nope. pictures of like the models and then one of me, one with the camera, and they're like, nope, no, nope, no, no. X. I'm going like, Bumble, you're screwed. I've been banned for like years now. It's Good really to know. <laughs> if you, if you would have gotten the Scholastic contract, what would you have done? Dude, like what would have been the the idea? The idea was they wanted to start with three schools. There was one in Arkansas, one in Missouri, and one in Alaska. Wow. Yeah. So the idea was my idea. They had shot with two previous videographers because they were still testing out the project. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to find the the team, the right team. They they showed me what they had filmed before, and it was very much like, what has this program done for the kids? Like to the kids, hey, what do you like about this program? Oh, I like that I get free books. And that's cool, it's talking about the program. But, you know, the approach that we wanted to take was more of seeing the kid at home, seeing the kid like interacting with the books at home, talking to the parents. Hey, how have you seen a change in your child through this program? Not necessarily, oh yeah, this program is great, but like what, do you see your kid coming home excited, asking you to read them a bedtime story type situation? And then also talking to the teachers and being kind of telling the story of like, why did they become a teacher? What is their passion for teaching these kids? And then incorporating the fact that, yeah, and it's really great to be able to have this tool like this program in order to help teach these kids and the importance of reading. So telling more of the story of the people around the program Mm -hmm. rather than the program itself. I love that. Yeah. You're you're bringing back a video I saw recently and it was talking about how the best companies out right now are making content that has nothing to do with their product 
but more to do with a lifestyle or with um, a, like a, the example is Red Bull. Yeah. Right? If you go on Red Bull's page, you never see a can of Red Bull. Right. You always see extreme sports, you see them on a mountain, you see them with a GoPro, you see them riding a bull, but you never see the can, you don't see the actual product. Why? Because their focus is community building. And then through the community building, people are gonna ask, what exactly is it? And they find out about the product, right? But it generates so much conversation, yep. right? That the product gets sold either way. And that's, and they compared it to Bang, right? Bang is really big down here, yep. right? But Bang is all product focused, yes. right? And the cool part of the video was that they put the social medias together and then the engagements and interactions were completely different. You oh, had wow. hundreds of thousands of views on Red Bulls yeah. and you had a quarter of that on Bang, right? Even though Bang's page was a lot bigger because it's a younger audience, sure. right? But there wasn't that community aspect that Red Bull has, right? right? And so even with ideas that I have for other projects and what you just told me right now, it's mm-hmm. amazing to see how you can build a community without forcing the product down people's throats. Dude, case in point, Yeti. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Like, I mean, they show their products and mm-hmm. their sh- and their films and stuff like that, yeah. but it's about whoever they're filming. Right. Like the Yeti presents uh, like playlists on their YouTube. Mm-hmm. I've gone through every single one of those videos <laughs> more times than I can count, dude. Right. Like there's this, there's this one video uh, and it's called Cosmo and it follows this Bahamian fisherman that they bring down to this, the, one of the most remote places you could ever fish in the world. like. I forget it's like i want to say it's indonesia i could be off base but like somewhere out there right. and like you have to go on a boat sleep on a boat for a week or something and then like take another little boat to like the other little in spot the middle of nowhere. in the middle of fucking nowhere yeah. um and it's just following his story about how he got into fishing how his father got him into fishing and then now he has a son and how he's bringing his fishing to his son and like it's connecting them and stuff like that and throughout the the video you see them fishing and stuff but like then it's overlaid with this voiceover about his story and like fishing and his passion. Now, once do they say the word Yeti, like right. like you see him like drinking out of a bottle or like you see the coolers and stuff, but like not a single word mentioned about it. Mm. And that that drives that drives the audience because right. they it makes you fall in love with the brand because right. you see these people. And it's like these are common stories almost, and like you can relate to them and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, another quick example of that was there's this guy in Texas, and I forgot. The last big hurricane that they had there. So many. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the exact one, <laughs> but so he had one of those like big ass trucks that are like big tires and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And he went around like helping people towing their cars and stuff like that. It has nothing to do with like fishing or outdoor life. It's just a good human being, you know, neighborly. And that was a story that they told. Right. And like, dude, that was awesome to see. And it's like, you're still telling a brand story. And he's still using Yeti, but it's it's a little bit different. So it's bringing in a different audience to it's you. It's a lot different. I think it's different in the right way. Yeah, that's what we want. I think any company wants a community. Yeah, right? yeah. Because when you have 100%. a community, you're always you have loyalty almost. Yes. Uh, you have people who identify with what you're trying to do, and whether they buy the product or not, you're still gaining people's trust. You're still gaining people's love, and it's only a bonus that they buy the Red Bull can, right? Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. It's awesome to see, and even so, it's cool that you're a creative, but you're also a business owner, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're seeing both sides of it all. Have you incorporated that a little bit into Guava? With how you, what, how it is that you create your content? Um, like, would you want to see Guava grow into more than just a production agency? Yes. Agency? So something that we are toying Secrets. with. Secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get it out. I need to know. <laughs> I volunteer as tribute of all the reflectors <laughs> to uh, bring water bottles to people. I can learn how to do hair and makeup. Like, I'm just letting it out there. Mm-hmm. Man of many traits. <laughs> there we go. Um, so are you're, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Magnolia Home brand. A little bit. A little bit. Um, so I've always been inspired about what they do and how they built their entire brand. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really, I was recently in Texas like a year ago and I visited Waco, Texas. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the story of what happened there. No. Uh, short version, basically there was a religious person, a crazy religious person that got a bunch of people to believe in him. Yeah, and not like, suicide, eh? not suicide, they locked themselves in a building and like were in a huge shootout with the police. And it was like, after that, Waco, Texas, like, no one wanted to live there because it was like this weird like stigma from all that so these magnolia people went in there and like ingested a bunch of money and they built this beautiful like out of those old like corn silos they built this like awesome kind of um you remember winwood yard Mm -hmm. 
So it was like a Wynwood yard, but like on steroids as far as like shops and like furniture stores and like all this stuff. So that kind of inspired me in that sense. So what they were doing and like what I want Guava K to end up going is kind of helping community building more um, and kind of document that as well so like kind of giving back to the community because marco and i we both love like working with our hands as well not just camera and editing stuff Mm -hmm. so like kind of building some sort of outreach with that um again with uh the last hurricane that hit uh the bahamas specifically the island that we used to go to completely devastated i would love to find a way to kind of go down there and document more to kind of spot put like a spotlight a little bit more on the situation because you know how news cycles work like you know it's here for a little bit just like all the school shootings we sh- oh everyone cares everyone cares and then news cycle dies and then no one cares anymore type right. of situation um so that's one avenue that i kind of want to take it in the other avenue is i recently uh we recently got a chance to work with uh nobu san from nobu hotel yeah no, i was super super stoked about that yeah congratulations uh thank you appreciate it um and I don't know if you've seen his sushi club. No, I haven't. So it's like an apparel line and it's called California Sushi Club. Mm. Uh, but the way that he's introducing it and like the items that he's producing is really interesting and cool. And so I'm kind of, we're kind of starting a little thing like that too. I don't want to say too much, but like that's a little direction that's that we're going exciting. to in the Guava Cake Club. Super exciting! Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, how much is the membership fee for? Uh... <laughs> to be to be determined. <laughs> to be determined. I love that for you. But yeah, 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 that's kind of like something that we're going to, and then you know, down the line, we would love to have a space as well, a multifunctional space, kind of like um, you've seen some that are here in Miami, mm-hmm. where they have a bunch of different little studios and yeah. stuff um some of them are catered for a more niche market uh like this one place that i know i've shot at lux studio mm-hmm. I think. yeah I shot yeah. there too yeah yeah, yeah. yeah super nice. um so they have a pretty niche kind of aesthetic mm-hmm. we would want to change not change it but do our own and make it more in the sense of like you see those photos like vanity fair mm-hmm. and stuff like that that kind of old kind of school kind mm-hmm. of texture and wood floors type like that so that's kind of an idea good we'll very cool that. yeah i think that's a huge thing that's missing here like i was yeah. in la a few months ago there's a studio in every corner yes right and so yes. funny that's an idea that i had as well like this was like an experiment mm-hmm. but i'm um, having cool like unique sets and maybe not as niche as, uh, as other studio but right. definitely having like a bunch of sets that can be used at the same time yeah. like i think the best example is h gab like, yes they they killed it like yes. they have i think they're opening up a location in Fort Lauderdale as well yeah but I it's how you know they have three four rooms and it's all very complete you need you don't need to do anything but bring a camera right and it's that's the idea that should be the vibe I yeah 100 percent. and yeah. like with all the transitioning people from la and new mm-hmm. york and miami's really kind yeah. of blowing up or south Florida in general mm-hmm. it's like we're gonna start needing that exactly. and like now productions can fully come and shoot here mm-hmm. they don't have to do part-time la part-time well, miami part-time new york how situation. exciting isn't it it's it's exciting i mean it's it's there's pros and cons to everything of course i'll say that um let's you focus know. on the pros yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's focus on the good thing yeah, more there's an people. opportunity yeah. for a really good business to be to 100 yeah um speaking about gear and working with your hands and stuff so normally i ask this question at the beginning of the podcast okay but uh I know that you are a, um, how do I say this? You're a connoisseur of fine cameras. <laughs> you can say I'm a like a snob. It's fine. It's fine. You are a man who has fine, refined, exquisite, expensive taste in your equipment, sir. Could you please let the audience know about this brand I heard so much about? I could drop my camera in the ocean and then still use it, right? That's how it works. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Tell me about Leica, please. Um, so I actually, you know what's crazy is that I didn't know what Leica was. Like, I didn't know Leica was a company, mm-hmm. nothing. Uh, when I started, I was Nikon, Nikon, that's all I thought about. Right. Um, I want to say 2017, 2018, around there, uh, I started working for Leica just because I saw an opening for someone... Um, that it was the i remember the indeed thing it was like a photo company looking for photography salesman i was like okay well i'm in photography maybe i'll pick up the salesman on the side whatever uh so i applied and just happened to get lucky i guess i don't know (laughs) i was like yeah you guys want me 
awesome. Yeah. And imposter <laughs> syndrome. I was like, are you sure? You want me? Really? really? There's so many other. I can refer you to somebody yeah, else. Yeah. There's like a long list of you friends that are You ever heard of Marco? Like... <laughs> um, so I started working for Like a Storm Miami. And I mean, once you're there, man, it's just the Kool-Aid's all around you. And I'm just like <laughs> chugging it all in. Like it was just, it, it's it's a different feel when I'm shooting with a Leica. I don't know. It's, you know, now we're into the Sony system for videos mm -hmm. and all the buttons, all the menus, crazy. My Leica is the most minimalistic, simple thing. There's four buttons. The menu is very simple. Like it just, it's a more user friendly camera in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, granted during my training, I did have to like for customers when they don't believe about the weather ceiling, I literally take a full glass of water and I, dump it on the camera. I would have a heart attack. I, I had one the first time I saw it, dude. I was like, that's a $10,000 piece of equipment. What are you yeah, doing? He's like, no, it's fine. And kept shooting. And I was, I was blown away. Yeah. But it wasn't until after my first year, they sent me to training in Germany to mm -hmm. the factory. Dude, that's when I like became a freaking like a nerd. Yeah. Like, because everything's handmade. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew that, yeah. but, and the factory everyone's like in pristine uh what are those like lab coat outfits and stuff it, it, there is a guy in our group that sneezed three times was asked to step outside literally like they can't have any of that in the atmosphere like it is so meticulously clean and like even if there's an element like um so this is actually a element from one of the lenses mm -hmm. It was 98% perfect and they toss it away because it wasn't 100%. Like that's how like meticulous they are about their equipment. With every single part. Every single part. So then when you're using like what, just when it comes to quality of content, what do you see immediately different colors. from like a Sony? Colors. The Leica color science is something that I have not seen come out of any other camera. Granted, you can edit a photo to as much as you want to get that look and you'll you'll achieve it. But right out of camera, I don't know a single other camera brand that has those colors. And I've shot with Canon, Nikon, now Sony's and Panasonic's even, and just the Leica color, man. I don't know what it is. It's just, it's just, you're gonna Leica the way you look, man. That's Bro, all I can say. <laughs> it's funny, I remember when you showed it to me for the first time, it was heavy, it felt like, it was just a very strong piece of equipment, like uh, yeah. out of a steel brick in my hand. And that's and that's the other thing too. It's like, so that camera, the one that I mainly use, the SL2, that's like their digital workhorse camera. Whereas most people know Leica for their rangefinder cameras. And that's like, you know, you see famous photos of Muhammad Ali and like the famous photo of like the sailor kissing the girl in Times Square bending over. That that's was like the Leica. Yeah. yeah okay. like. Leica was the first camera to shoot 35 millimeter film. Like they were the pioneers, all the World War II photos, all Leicas, well, mostly Leicas. Um, and you know, that's, it's weird. There's been a weird, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, like a weird gap because people think of Leica as like that old school camera and like the rangefinder camera. And they're not as familiar with like their newer technology cameras like the one that I use. Mm -hmm. So I don't see people really gravitating towards Leica to use it for workhorse campaign style productions. And that's actually the reason why I started my YouTube channel was because there's no real information about Leica online mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Leica's whole marketing thing is like, look at all these old famous photos we have. Don't you want to be a part of history? Mm -hmm. People our age and younger, like they don't give a fuck. Right. They don't right. excuse excuse my French. Um, and so like being able to put Leica in the sense of content creation and being more relative in today's time is something that I'm pushing. And you know, to <laughs> going full circle with uh imposter syndrome, I never know whether I'm actually like reaching to people, but I hadn't posted in like few months I want to say and I just posted one recently trying out two different lenses and like I got a bunch of comments like oh my god so happy to see you back on the Leica grind like yeah I keep putting out this content there's no other content like like mm -hmm. and I'm just like to myself I'm just like damn dude damn Victor why do you get so like into yeah. your head about it like clearly there's a need like clearly people are enjoying mm -hmm. it there's just something about niche yeah. Right. yeah 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 
Yeah, because I mean, there's a million people reviewing different cameras of all brands and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but Leica is just very niche and like, there's not much information out there. People don't want to, I guess, invest in the system. Is, is that like, what it is? Is that what makes it not as popular? It's a big, I mean, it's a big price point. Right. Um, for the same price, you can probably get, uh, I don't know, what's the A1 now? Like five grand or something like Six that? Six grand. Six grand, yeah. okay. Maybe maybe not the A1, but like- the, Like an R5? Yeah, an yeah. R5 is like three, four. four. Three. Yeah, exactly. People will rather gravitate towards that. And also because it's a more commonly used brand. Mm -hmm. The other thing you have to remember is that uh, Leica didn't, like for example, Leica didn't have a flash trigger for any type of flash brand. Profoto just came out with one this year. Wow. Yeah. yeah and so like, no off camera flash for the like. None. Wow. None. Yeah. So like it, it's slowly, slowly getting there. And also the video aspect, that's also, it's still not there. It's slowly getting there. What specs does your camera have for video? I mean, it, it's got everything you need. It's got 4K 60, okay. um, UHD uh, 120. But like ten bit color, I'm guessing. Yeah, ten bit color, four two two. Um, oh, it sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it's got everything you need. The only, the major thing about it is autofocus, trash. Really. Contrast based still, and it's just it's nowhere compared to these Sony's with face detection. Mm -hmm. To that point, though, as a videographer and filmmaker, like I am trying to get away from those autofocus lenses, and now I'm investing in Leica R lenses that are completely manual. Interesting, and dude. The the video I was telling about the six minute one that mm -hmm. was all shot on a manual thirty five millimeter R. Like the, the amount of retakes, I can only assume you got. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> like would... because the focus was just like slightly, slightly off. off, and I was just like, oh, okay, redo it. And it's like, isn't that part of the fun? It is. Mm -hmm. It is exactly. I was just gonna say that. It's like, yes, it takes a long time. Yes, it's trial and error, but that's what makes a journey in the process fun. Right. You, you got to fuck up in order to like create something beautiful. Mm -hmm. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Well, and I, I remember you telling me that the lenses are also weird focal length, not weird, they're just different focal They're lengths. different. Yeah. So like the standard 20, 24 to 70, they decided to go 2490. Right. Why? No, no idea. <laughs> it's not, it's not a fixed aperture. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's an F4, mm -hmm. but I mean, with that lens, dude, that's that's usually what I just yeah. take. I yeah. only take that lens and I don't need anything else really. 100%. Um, like their next jump up is uh, 100 to, or no, 90 to 280. Also a weird focal that's, length. That's everything. Yeah, but that's everything. Yeah, those two lenses are good. Granted that 280 lens is like 6,500, which I think is a complete. <laughs> There's no adapters for Leica? No. Well, so yes and no. Um, there are adapters to use um, on certain Leica cameras. Mm -hmm. And now uh, in the past, I think two or three years, Leica has teamed up with Sigma and Panasonic. Okay. So they're making Leica mount lenses, which are substantially oh, wow. cheaper. Yeah. Um, there's a difference. There, 100% there's a difference yeah. in the quality for sure. But I mean, for day-to-day -day stuff, dude, like you're not gonna, like unless you're filming like a masterpiece film, mm -hmm. like you're not really gonna see the difference. Gotcha. Like I know a bunch of uh, Leica users that are now like switching to Sigma and Panasonic because they get to save some money and dude, they're killing it. Yeah. Then I feel like there's, I'm never gonna not buy gear. Right, like there's always, I feel every every photographer, the moment a new lens comes out or a new camera, we're always putting in the card just in case, you never know. And the amount of times I have to tell Marco to put away his credit card. <laughs> you know, that Marco and I him. compete. Every time I see Marco with a new camera, I'm like, man, where's this money coming from? Yeah, you guys are killing it in Guava. Like, you know, <laughs> always got the brand, the newest camera, newest lighting, he has a whole truck full of lights. I'm like, Marco, bro. You know, I, I will say we have been fortunate enough that, uh, Nanlite actually sponsored, sponsored us, uh, so that was that was awesome. That was really cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, dude, I am constantly Amazing. like, Margo will send me like a B and H link. He's like, yo, 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 yo. I'm like, no, 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 we don't no, need no, no, business, bro. We don't need it. Our cameras are good enough. <laughs> that is a constant saying between us. Our cameras are good enough. Do you guys use exclusively the A ones for video? Um, no, actually. So he shoots now the A one photos and stills, mm -hmm. and then we both have FX threes. Those nice. are like the that's our work. Dude, I it's the best thing ever. Right? I have this one as, a, as an S3 that I'm using. The S3? Yeah, which is the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but uh, we actually had an FX3 uh, like a year and a half ago and he ended up selling it. I forgot what was the reason why and then got that when the new uh, R5 came out. Mm -hmm. He went into that. And I then, remember for like a month or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, screw this. <laughs> Overheating issue. Yeah, like, no, yeah. screw this. Uh, and I had the same issue because uh, instead of going to Canon, Fuji is always like the closest to color science for Leicas. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'll jump into the X-T4 when that came out. Great little like camera, but overheating like crazy. Quick, especially um, with the sun over here. Yeah. yeah, and the color correcting for Fuji, it was difficult. Why? You, you used DaVinci, right? So at that point in time, I was still on Premiere. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure with DaVinci, I think I might be able to get there faster now, um, obviously with practice. But when I first got the Fuji film, I don't know, it just seemed like it was the footage was super green and I just couldn't get that out of my footage for whatever reason. And I remember Marco used to bitch at me all the time for that. He's like, it's dude, green. it's still green, it's still green, it's still green. I'm just like, well, I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> um, so now that camera usually just sits on a shelf and that's like my travel camera essentially gotcha. like, i'll gotcha. take that like when i'm going on vacation or something like that uh i tend not to take the leicas just for safety issues and the fact that you know it's a lot of money and i oh, don't want to sure. lose that oh, for sure. so um and then the fx3 doesn't really take photos really i mean it does but not really i've never tried taking photos with the s3 which is no same same specs right I well i think so but the nice thing about the s3 is that you do have a uh, an EVF viewfinder, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the FX3, you don't have anything, you right. just have the LCD. And I, I've always, I don't knock other photographers for doing this, but I've always felt weird looking at an LCD when I'm shooting. You know, that's what I do, right? And yeah. the reason why I do is because when I first started creating, it was only video. So I never used oh, okay. it, I, don't, I never used a little screen, right? So and you then, got used to it that yeah, way. Yeah, because I've never had to use it before. So I've always used the LCD. That makes and sense. And then whenever I go on a shoot and I put another photographer, they always laugh at me for that yeah. reason. Like, why are you not doing the viewfinder? I'm like, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never used it before. But uh, <laughs> it's no. true, I get shit all the time for that. No, I, 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 I've called time. people out <laughs> all the time. Well. <laughs> I'm like, how about you take your photos and let me work, okay? <laughs> have the screen right here you can't even see it no it's crazy <laughs> but that's actually uh that's one of the other things i really like about the leica too it's a massive evf so it's like very comfortable around your eye and like it is beautiful to like look through that was, was it a hard cool. transition going from the color signs of leica and and you said nikon, nikon. going to the sony's because every time i i hear that transition it's always about like the pinkish or the fusion of the mm -hmm. sony, uh, sony very footage. very much so um it's I would say though the Sony footage has been easier to color correct mm -hmm. than the Leica. Really? Because the Leica's not really they're not they just became a video company mm -hmm. maybe 4 years ago, 5 years. So like they're still learning. Don't get me wrong, their Cine lenses are like they use them on movie sets all the time. The lenses are insane. Okay. But the actual camera bodies, they're like just starting to get into video. So like there's still some tweaking they need to do there. Um, like they have two uh, Leica LUTs, they have a classic and a natural. And dude, when you put those on the footage, it like, it destroys the footage. Oh. Yeah. Do they know that it destroys the footage? Oh, I'm sure they do. I've complained about it in multiple videos and comments and stuff like that. Do you um, still work for them? I don't work for them like yeah. directly, but I still, so I provide content for them on a monthly basis. And then I'm still in the process of creating a dedicated workshop for video. Um, so I'm still in contact with like their East Coast reps and stuff like that. And I've very built cool. relationships through them or very, not. Very cool. um, but, but yeah, the, the LUTs that Leica provides are just not there. Um, so, and for Leica, you're actually shooting in Rec 2020. Why? It's just the way that they developed the cameras. I don't know why they didn't decide to just do 709. Mm -hmm. um, so in DaVinci, once you go from 2020 back to 709, then I can really play around with any sort of LUT that I want. Mm -hmm. Like we have a bunch of like Phantom LUTs that we play around with or like Tropic Color as well. And like, then you can really play with the footage. But Very cool. making that transition, I found definitely helps with the footage for sure. Love that. Mm -hmm. And then when did you transition from Premiere to DaVinci? This is a big <sighs> one, I feel. That was huge. And that was also a Marco thing, uh, pushing me into that. <laughs> <laughs> he's like dude i just bought this thing and he bought the one with like the little like keyboard stuff mm -hmm. and whatnot i was like 
dude, I'm pretty proficient in Premiere. Like I have my whole system. I don't know. I don't know. And I think I spent one day, like just three hours, like YouTubing, DaVinci and stuff like that. And then I got into there and like kind of wet my feet. It, it wasn't even about like the entire platform was confusing to me. So I just started in the color just to mm -hmm. see like what all the hype was about. And like, once I understood node trees and like parallel node trees, I was like, wow, this makes so much more sense. Like, I don't know, it just clicked for me somehow. And just the ease of the process of color grading through DaVinci just was way better than I had in Premiere. Right. Um, granted, again, the other thing I think about is like in DaVinci, because I was it was a new tool, I was looking up all new little things on YouTube, whereas Premiere, I was already like set my way. So like, there could have been a bunch of tools I, I was not using and like they could have been amazing yeah. but like i was just so set in my process in my way that i wasn't like looking up oh what's the new update do like i would just update and be like okay going back to my normal screen and like my normal tools right so there's something to be said about that and i know now specifically premiere came out with this auto something for podcasts i saw Did you see that? i've never used it i haven't used it yet maybe i'll use it for this one. Oh my That's god brand new. it yeah. was it looked amazing yeah. the results like it cutting up everything and putting i was just like Michael Beck. <laughs> AI, man. AI. That's, you, that's the other thing that I'm like worried about. I, I, I wanted to get your opinion on that. I'm not scared of AI. Okay. It's a tool. Yeah. Right? And it's all about who can use the tools to the best of their ability to create what they need to create. Mm -hmm. um, I think whoever adapts the quickest to using them and to figuring out how to use them will succeed in the long run. Yeah. Right. Because I think, like anything else, you have to learn how to use it. Yeah. And I was, oh, I forgot the name of the one that I was messing around with. It's the one where you can take a video and then turn it into like an animation and then go back to the regular video. I forgot the name of it. Um, oh, I don't know that one. Well, there's an app called One Way that does it a little bit uh -huh. where you can upload the a, like a seven second clip and then you can like describe, I want it to look like a cloud person, right? And then it'll turn that clip into cloud animation. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called the One Way app. Okay. There's a desktop version of it. I forgot the name. It's with OpenAI, mm -hmm. but it takes clips and, it and you put in like, I want it to be cyberpunk futuristic and it'll turn your video and the entire video into that scene, right? Which is super cool. Damn. However, it's all about how you input what it is that you want. So you need to be as descriptive as you can about every aspect of the video in order to get it to look exactly how you want it to look, which is extremely difficult. Yes. Right? And, and that's where like people shouldn't be as scared of AI because AI still needs you right. to be the creative right. to tell it what to do. Right. It can just do it on its own. Right. And so the people who will take advantage of that the quickest will do the best in the long run. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's still work. Yeah. Right? yeah. And 100%. not everyone is willing to do all that. No matter how easy it is, it still takes time and effort. Yeah. And that's the hardest part that I find uh, for myself as a creative. And then what I can see happening in the future. Like, there's still going to be a barrier of entry. Yeah. And the same thing with video, same thing with photography. There's still a learning curve. Yeah. And within that learning curve, the people who have already adapted are going to do the best. And the ones who haven't are going to not do as well. Right, right. right. It's, it's all about like changing on a dime and adapting to the new tools around exactly. you. And I mean, I know one photographer, I'm blanking uh, of his name, Tim something, um, but he has stopped posting photos. He only posts AI images, but they are the most, it's like a whimsical, very colorful kind of AI image. So it's like, it's photos of models and stuff, but like in scenarios where like you can only picture that in your dreams, like making that a reality would take so much production and time. Like mm -hmm. it really wouldn't be feasible for some of the stuff that he does. And it's so interesting. Like it's really cool seeing it. I don't see it really pushing into mainstream like commercial work stuff just yet. Uh, but like you said, it's, learning how to use a tool for your own advantage and like and to the point of like the descriptive words i use chat gpt a bunch but i have to tell it exactly what i need it and then once it spits out whatever then i go in there revise it actually put it more in this tone from this perspective type situation it's right. like the tool is going to keep learning from you but you still have to give it a little bit of information in order exactly. to like work for you exactly yeah. but i know people that are like freaked out dude like they're like looking like going back to school, I need to figure out a new job, like, I had photography's gotta be gone. I was like, I don't, you don't gotta go crazy like that, but. You know what yeah. it is? I think people still wanna have your photos taken, Yeah, right? I think people still wanna go to these places and still be seen and AI can only do so much, but you can't recreate an experience. Right, 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 right? exactly. So, the, the team environment, the team right. building, like, you know, 
people hated COVID because mm-hmm. we weren't able Once to do that. It. Like yeah. that's a whole experience of a photo shoot mm-hmm. essentially. It's like that team chemistry, that networking, right. bringing together like-minded minds. Right. And I tell photographers all the time, especially new ones, like you're not just booking a shoot, you're booking an event, right, right. for this person. And they're there to be around you for an hour, two hours, however long it takes, yeah. and then feed off each other's energy and each other's creativity. You can't replicate that with AI, right? right? Yeah, you can make an, an amazing image and put it, the girl on the mountain with a spaceship and cool right. on AI, but if you're not the one that's there putting it together, the model isn't there experiencing it and showing those emotions, it's, that's that's what it means to be human, yeah. right? And so I'm not scared of AI. I think AI can augment photos that we take already. Right? Sure. I think we can always combine them together, but I don't think it's gonna replace. I think it's just gonna enhance what we do already. Yeah. Um, I hope. I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope. And, and, and I say that, <laughs> In our industry, I am 100% certain there are some industries that AI is extremely scary because it's legit taking their job completely. Did you hear about, what was it? Uh, I forgot the name, going blank. The the ad agency that fired everybody, um, um, they did the photo with Kim Kardashian and she had the champagne glass on her butt. Okay, I know and, the photo. Yeah, so that agency, I forgot I forgot the name, but they fired everyone, they, they fired everybody. Like they, no, they have no more editors now. How does an editorial agency fire the editors who create the content that they promote, right? Okay. Yeah, they gone. Everybody. Uh, So like my only thinking there (laughs) is like, I mean, I guess they could be using AI to write articles and then Mm -hmm. just kind of comb through them. But like the actual, okay, this, (laughs) this triggered a question in my head how where does it where does the law like lie as far as like if that agency wants to come out with a publication of kim kardashian again maybe with a different color dress whatever do they just ai kim and it's like where does kim's rights come up there right like that's that's what's really interesting to Mm -hmm. me especially in our industry is Mm -hmm. like when do those rights go just to AI because all that information is out online mm-hmm. and it's just gathering that and building something from that? Mm-hmm. Or is it like that's still the rights of the person's face that you're using type situation? I can imagine somebody being like, you know, what? I don't feel like going to go film this uh, this photo shoot. Just use my AI rendering. And I could totally see that happening. I could totally see it. That's you want crazy. me to go spend six months there? Nah, just AI me in the joint. You know, like... I could totally see that occurring That's, or yeah. being booked multiple locations on the same day. No, just AI and me everywhere. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right. No, that's a hundred percent true. That's crazy. And I mean, you would have to, it would have to be someone with enough internet presence mm-hmm. to like really get like good sense of it. Unless there is some company collecting like, you go in there and they do full body scan. I would not be surprised. And then I would not here be is your digital file of you. You can take it to any AI company. And they can use your image. And they can use you your license image. the image or whatever, use it. I could totally see that happening. Yeah. I could totally see it happening. I mean, they they have that in, if you're playing NBA 2K and you have a camera, it scans your face and you're the player in the game. Crazy, right? That's like, I didn't even, that's like so low on my idea of AI, but that's like, that's what that is. Yeah. 100%. That's crazy. Have you seen the trend? I don't know how deep in TikTok you are, but AI Drake. I so I I <laughs> heard like the um the songs. There's a bunch of songs. Yeah, they sound just like him. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've I'm heard here, like Kanye singing Jay Z songs yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's insane. And I'm here listening to it. I'm like, I could totally hear Drake saying all this shit. Like, I know. So it shows two things. One, that, was, that was a little scary for me, right? Yeah. But it shows how much of an influence certain people have, like artists, because mm-hmm. we just want to hear his voice. He can yeah. say whatever he wants to say, but right. the fact that it's his voice, right? We're like, oh yeah, it's Drake. Because we're comfortable with it because yeah. we grew up with him pretty much. But to it's crazy. That, it's super weird, but yeah. to, to the point, does Tupac release another album next year? Could you imagine? Like, they could. They Anyone could. could. do it. Anyone could. Now we have hologram concerts now too. Yeah. Like, Let's go to a Biggie Smalls concert. That's... <laughs> That is wild. Go to see Michael up. Jackson live. I'm just like, I immediately transported to like a Star Wars world and you just like have hologram concerts yeah. and no, like- I'll get my neighbor with the VR porn and to come yeah. in and, <laughs> and just put the Oculus on and that's it. We're at a concert now. Dude, uh, did you ever see the movie Wally? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, basically, do you know the premise of mm-hmm, it? Like the- The little like robot world's like 
lives on a spaceship. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The fat people and their little scroll, like little. That's, that's what we're aiming towards, yeah. dude. Oh my god. Like, <laughs> it's scary to think about, but like they are trying to make life just so mundane and easy that it's just like robots and AI and. And they live happily ever after. Yeah, just sit back eating whatever the hell and like and fat. <laughs> Rotten and... to death. Yeah, dude. That's scary. That's that part is definitely scary. But I think we have a couple of decades now. Yeah, yeah. I'm really? not I I don't I would never worry about that really in our life's time. Yeah. I don't I I say that now and watch it like next <laughs> Three year. years from now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like all of a sudden we're living on Mars <laughs> and like AI is taking over Earth and oh who knows? God. I think time is moving too fast, man. I'm gonna go live in a hut somewhere. Oh, yeah. A mile in the Caribbean. That's a dream. That's true. Yeah. Honestly, like uh, when I was recently, we were recently in the Bahamas for, I was assisting uh, a job for uh, Joey Wright. And um, dude, I was I was waking up every day, like at six, just to watch the sunrise. I'm just sitting there like, I could just be like a, like a first mate on one of these boats. That just like out in the Bahamas all year round. The owners live in like Montauk or something. They fly down for the summer type situation. Yeah. Just like live the island life. No material possessions, whatever, chilling. I feel know? like you'd be a lot happier too. Oh my god, just <laughs> so nice. No traffic, no like car horns, no alarms. Oh man, nothing to worry about except the hurricane every now and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've been through those. That's fine. That's Every fine. Year. You hunker down, you tie down, the strap <laughs> the cement block. You're fine. Tie it down. You're fine. You're Get fine. on the roof if you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be fine. You're fine. Thank you, brother. I, I really appreciate you coming through. No. I appreciate this conversation. I appreciate you being so vulnerable. I just, this has been fun. It reminds me why I like doing these. And no, so I really, I really appreciate your time. Man. It's been my pleasure. I'm happy that I was able to finally <laughs> come up here and do it because I know I've been a flake. Um, no. But no, I greatly appreciate it. And dude, I, I love that you're shedding light with what you're saying of why you started this podcast. Like, I, I think that's awesome. And dude, I, I I've been loving the content you've been putting out. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, so, where can people find you on social media? You and your agency. So Victor double underscore Quintana with a Q, and then Quintana Guava K <laughs> Media. Uh, if you search for it, I think it's Guava K underscore Media. But if you search for it, it'll pop up. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, brother. No, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, that was so fun. Dude, that was awesome. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs>